Is it possible to teach English as a non-native speaker? And if so, how? These are questions that I know a lot of you have because you've given them to me in comments in my videos. And I don't know because I am a native speaker. However, I know a really great man named Amar who is both a non-native speaker and an English teacher. So he is going to join me and give us some advice here. Amar, how's it going? Fine. Hello, Mr. Robert. How are you doing? I'm do doing fantastic. It's good to see you. Always a pleasure to talk with you. I pleasure. wanted... I wanted to start things off by apologizing to you because we were scheduled to do this live stream about three weeks ago, I want to say, and uh, I ended up having a little bit of a medical scare and I had to cancel the day of, and I still feel bad about that. Um, everyone's fine, but thank you so much for having patience and understanding, even though we had to cancel last minute. Oh, I'm so sorry for you and Merry Christmas, everybody. Hey, thanks. Uh... <laughs> So let me pose the question to you. Uh, well, actually, before I pose the question, let's get to know you a little bit. So tell me, you know, I know you, but my viewers don't know you yet. So who are you? What do you do? And uh, what are you all about? Okay. So again, I repeat, hello and welcome, everybody. Um, uh, Merry Christmas. And in the beginning, I would like to thank you all for coming and watching me and hearing some advice from me. And thank you, Mr. Robert, for giving me this chance. My name is Amar Galal al-Din. I am an English uh, teacher. I'm Egyptian. I'm 39 years old, and I've been teaching English for more than 15 years now. Yes, I graduated from Faculty of Arts, English Department, 2004 where I majored in uh, English literature, both English literature and American literature. I teach English as a foreign language, um, and that's it. Awesome, thank you. So, the question, is it possible to become a teacher as a non-native speaker? Obviously, <laughs> you are, so the answer is yes, but why don't you tell my viewers how that happened? What was your journey like in becoming a teacher? What did you do? Well, after graduate, uh, graduation, I started working as an English teacher where I worked in uh, language schools. I, I, I taught uh, different levels of students, primary students, middle classes, high classes. And after that, I felt that I have the passion for teaching English. Uh, the passion uh, increased and increased. I wanted to teach the four skills equally. I wanted to teach listening, speaking, reading, writing, and uh, teaching all of the skills equally in the schools, I think is going to be something very, very hard. So I did something like uh, career shifting. So I started teaching English. Uh, for adults and teens and I started my own startup which is a page on Facebook where I gave one-on-one -on -one classes to non-native speakers uh, in the Middle East in Asia in Latin America where I taught them um, general English classes conversation outings where I practiced lots of activities to help them improve their accent improve their confidence when they speak in English. Awesome, thank you. And if we were to go back, let's say some of my viewers are still teenagers, they're still in high school. Uh, what's something that you think they could do to start to prepare now to become an English teacher if, if they're thinking about it, even though they haven't entered university yet? Do you have any advice there? Yes, of course, I have lots of advice for non-native non -native speakers who, uh, who, dreams, who dream to teach English. Actually, the first thing from an academic point of view is to test uh, herself or himself before teaching English. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about teaching, uh, testing their proficiency 
of English. So no problem if they um, uh, take a test like TOEFL test or the IELTS to test their proficiency because this is very, very uh, important before teaching English to the different levels of speakers. Uh, number two, it's not good idea. It's not a bad idea to take any professional development uh, courses like TEFL, TESOL, Delta, CELTA. This is going to equip any one of them with the skills needing needed for teaching English, because teaching English doesn't depend only on language itself. You know, as a teacher, because we have different topics that a teacher might uh, cover like classroom management, uh, learners' autonomy, learners' nature, first language acquisition. So they have to have background about this. Um, I think these are the two most advice, the most important advice that they must take care of before starting teaching English for uh, other non-native speakers. So just so I'm hearing you right, number one, you want to assess yourself so that you can figure yeah. out what gaps in knowledge you need to fill in yourself before you can start to learn about those teaching techniques? Yeah, that's great. Number two, uh, taking any professional development courses about teaching. Uh, number three, it is worth mentioning to, to study something. Let's take it as a self-study to know something about the other culture, to know something about the American culture, the American literature, that's really, really important. At the same time, they have to study something about phonetics and the pronunciation. Uh, teaching the pronunciation is really, really challenging. You know that we have over 2 billion English speakers all over the world. We have different accents, almost five dialects in England and about three to four dialects in America. So non-native speakers suffer a lot from uh, adopting one accent uh, to master. Uh, non-native speakers are crazy about the American English. They are, they are always arguing about the differences between American and the British. So an instructor, a teacher must take that into consideration. They have to study something about the American, for example, about the phonetics, the production of sounds, because we studied this in college. I still remember. Uh, they have to know something about pronunciation, uh, pronunciation all over the world. Let's say uh, the most two dominant accents, uh, American accent, British accent, because we prepare our students to my native speakers who come from different nationalities. So how come? So they have to work hard before teaching English. Yeah, I remember, uh, I think the first live stream that we did together on your channel a while back, we were talking about the American versus British accents. And I think you were arguing that you preferred the American accent, um, which was yes, interesting. Yes, of and course. Obviously, <laughs> yeah. obviously, I have an American accent and I teach that because that's what I know. But, um, you know, I, I try to stress to my students, Choose whatever accent you want, because no matter what, you're going to end up with your own accent. You're going to have your own yeah. unique accent either way. So yeah, that's it's really up to you. You get to choose your own path. And I'm glad that's that great. you mentioned um, learning about teaching skills, because if as a non-native speaker, you learn teaching skills before you start teaching, you already have an advantage over a lot of native speakers who fly over the ocean and they go and they teach in a country and they have no idea how to teach. They don't even know about phonics or anything. They're just over there and they happen to be a native speaker. So they get a job teaching children and it's unfortunate because they don't, they're not really qualified just because you were born with the language doesn't mean you know how to teach it. So I think you make a good point and you know, you're going to study teaching methods as well. Yeah, yeah. You know, academically, academically, like uh, David Nonan said one day in one of his books about teaching, that good teachers are born, not made. So we have to add something that we should be trained. And I can admit something about you, something that I admire a lot about your character. I still remember the first time when I saw one of your videos 
suggested videos on Facebook. And uh, besides your uh, nationality and being a native speaker, I admired something else, which is your talents. You integrated your talents, your musical talents, you uh, integrated your skills into teaching. So that's something quite exciting. So as you can see, it's not only language, it's not only native or non-native teacher, it's a, a formula, a lot of things. Skills play an important role, passion plays an important role. Uh, the teachers, uh, um, let's say, the teacher's experience play another important role. So it's a formula and we can spend lots of uh, seminars and lots of live streams talking about this. I'm not the only one to talk about this. Thank you for the kind words. Now you guys know why I like Amar. Uh, <laughs> no. Okay. We, we have a question. Uh, just to let you guys know, we're going to stop about halfway through and answer any questions. So we will get to your question, just not quite yet. Speaking of questions, um, what was the most challenging part of becoming a teacher for you? Yes. As I told you when you asked me the previous question, uh, as a non-native speaker, as I told you, I graduated in 2004, okay, and I think at that time uh, I didn't have enough financial resources, so I had to increase my level uh, and my proficiency in English, so I had to take courses. So the first thing uh, was acquiring language itself. You know, I was very passionate and I was very, very ambitious. I dreamt of teaching higher level students. So this meant that I had to increase my fluency at English. So this was the first challenge um, to me. And in the same time, uh, the professional development courses, you know, are, are not cheap. They are somehow expensive and they need dedication they need work hard working hard uh, so this was another point that you know made me suffer a lot that's why i depend on uh, free webinars uh, depended on myself and um, as a self-study reading books watching youtube uh, following the other tutors all over the world and i still remember those tutors from america who inspired me something someone like lisa meisen a great teacher who inspired me a lot so these things were really really um, important and i suffered a lot uh, before um, working as a teacher uh, professionally so it sounds like a lot of the most challenging things had to do with finances and coming up with the money to afford these things. And, and you were saying you were able to find either cheap or free resources. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. And I cannot forget the role that the American University here played in Egypt when they offered free courses for teaching English as a foreign uh, language. And alhamdulillah, I got my certificate about two months ago. So the American University helped me a lot. And the same time, I did a lot of crazy things. I accepted some uh, part-time jobs in hotels in the summer vacation because I thought it was uh, going to be exciting and smart if I travel to work in tourism in the summer to meet foreigners, I mean native speakers from all over the world. Yeah. That's why I will uh, gain, uh, gain experience and make a lot of money in the same time. So it wasn't a shame at all to work as a, a pass boy or to work as a desk agent, front office receptionist to learn English. Awesome. Yeah. So you guys are hearing it. I know that a lot of my viewers also have limited finances. So I think it's really important that you're bringing up the fact that there's resources available and also you need to get after it. You need to immerse yourself in the language in whatever way possible, even if it means you take a job working with, you know, people who are touring. So uh, we do have some questions. Ahmed, Natalie, FYI, we will answer those questions in about 15 minutes. Uh, we'll have a Q&A at that time. But feel free to keep posting questions for now, and we'll get to those. All right. So 
What would you say? I know that a lot of my students who are thinking about becoming a teacher, they're not confident in their current abilities. And you were mentioning that you need to find, you know, those gaps in knowledge. But what would you say to someone who doesn't feel like they know enough about the language to teach? They don't have that confidence. Okay, as I mentioned before, work on yourself, be optimistic, try to um, increase your proficiency and your fluency in English, immerse yourself, try to do anything in English. Teaching English is very, very easy. It depends on passion. Uh, why not teach yourself? Uh, I, I, I mean, uh, test yourself. Take a test to test your proficiency and to try to take the final report and to keep it uh, with your or along with your CV. That's very, very important, especially if you are working in the Middle East. And at the same time, seek uh, seek for a professional development course like TEFL, TESOL. By the way, I'm a TEFL holder, which is uh, lower than CELTA holders and DELTA holders, according to the OFQUAL system in England. But this doesn't mean that I am not qualified. I know the names of the great uh, mentors and uh, professors in teaching English. I follow them. I read about their advice. I buy their books. So you can uh, make it as a self-study without spending much money. And it's very easy. Uh, God will help you and you will always have a chance. It's not easy at all. No, no, no. It's not easy. It's not difficult, I mean. <laughs> you're very optimistic. So you're saying with studying, with yeah. putting in the time to find your gaps in knowledge, that helps build your confidence. Yeah, that's great. It depends on confidence. If you lose your confidence, you're not going to make it. Was there a time in your journey where you felt like you were losing your confidence? Yeah, yeah. When I... Uh... When I worked as a part-time in some other institutions and they didn't give me a chance for teaching and they asked me to keep uh, shadowing and uh, attend other classes with professional teachers and I kept attending those classes, taking notes, uh, like some, some, some kind of peer observation, you know, and I, I waited and waited for so long. So at this point, I felt that, oh, they're not going to accept me. I watched them enough. I am ready. I must go on. So I was about to um, to lose confidence, actually. But, you know, uh, I tried to, uh, to be more optimistic. I tried to look at the brighter side that I have the passion. I still remember my uh, my professor's advice. I still remember my professor's encouragement to me that one day you will have a chance. You're a good English teacher. You have the passion. Don't worry. Another another point when I felt that I lost uh, lost the passion or lost my self confidence when those supervisors. One day I worked in institutions as I told you and uh, language schools and actually the comments and the notes of the uh, supervisors were very very aggressive and harsh mm. uh, regarding the pronunciation they know quite well i am not a native speaker and i might make some uh, grammatical mistakes especially in the in the beginning yeah uh, i would i would make uh, some pronunciation mistakes and this wasn't a shame at all so they were very, very aggressive. So that's a negative point. I advise those teachers, think positively. We all here, we are all humans. We make mistakes and non-natives also make mistakes. Why not? Why not? You know, I'm, I'm a native speaker. I'm an Arabic native speaker. But this doesn't mean that I know the meaning of every Arabic word. <laughs> yeah. I know all the rules of grammar. No, absolutely not. And I think you too. Yeah, absolutely. We native speakers make mistakes, actual mistakes, and things that would be categorized as mistakes that are so common that maybe they're not mistakes. Um, for example, the word whom. This was something I mentioned in one of my recent videos. 
we don't use the word whom. Nine out of ten native speakers in the United States, at, the, at least, we don't say whom. We just don't. It's supposed to be the object, but we don't use it. So that's a mistake that native speakers are making all the time. And probably a rule that non-native speakers know better than native speakers who haven't studied the language like I have. Because, you know, I went to university to study linguistics and everything because I was passionate about it. But the average person on the street has no idea. They don't even, some of them don't even know what an adjective is, you know. Speaking of this, let's talk about you as a teacher versus native speakers as a teacher. Do you feel like you have to compete with native speakers as a teacher? Well, <laughs> that's a good and challenging question that I might answer from different sides. Uh, let's talk about the first side. If we're talking about teaching, I can say that there is no difference between uh, both of us. Good teachers are born, not made. So it's a matter of passion, a matter of training, a matter of experience, uh, a matter of understanding your students' nature. For example, if you're working in the Middle East, if you're working with some people from Saudi Arabia, so you will be able to understand their problems with uh, Arabic, with, with both Arabic and in English. So this will give you an advantage if you are a non-native speaker. Uh, and then this point, again, I would like to express my admiration with your talent and integrating your skills and hobbies in teaching. Okay. Uh, another side or another point regarding language, of course. Of course, no one can deny this. As a non-native speaker, your fluency is higher than me. Okay, so this will give you the advantage of working with higher level students. That's great. But this will not give you the same advantage of working with lower level students. Uh, let's say for some reason that... A native speaker will not be uh, aware of all the problems that we have uh, as Arab speakers or Spanish speakers or Japanese speakers when we learn English. You know, I'm talking about pronunciation. Absolutely, you know? yeah. Another point or the last point when we're talking about learners. When, we, when teaching non-native speakers, okay, uh, I think... Uh, will have good or solid understanding with the nature of students from their areas or from their uh, countries or cities. But uh, in general, I think uh, it's the same, no big difference. It's a challenging and really we can compete. Here in Egypt, we have uh, native teachers from America from England, from Switzerland, from Australia, who came and still uh, staying here in Egypt and enjoying teaching English. This doesn't mean that we, the Egyptians, uh, stopped teaching English. We work together in the same institutions. We have our students, you have your students, and things are going well. And personally, I like the idea of integration and cooperation. Teachers are for teachers. You help me, I help you, and this is for the sake of the students. I love that perspective, and I, I can't agree with you more. Uh, so just so I, I'm understanding you, right? It sounds like, no, you're not competing because native speakers and non-native speakers fulfill different roles as teachers, right? Yeah, because I completely agree. If I were given a pair of students who are native Arabic speakers and they're just starting off, there's no way I'm going to be able to handle them as well as you can. I don't know Arabic. I have no idea what sort of issues they're facing or what sort of, um, you know, things from the Arabic language they're trying to bring over the English that, that doesn't work. Um, yeah, you make a great point. Yeah. And I, I'm totally with you on that. But yeah, I think it makes sense too that you're saying when you get to a really advanced level, that might be the time when having a native speaker is um, 
more appropriate. Yeah, yeah. I can agree with you. And you know, where sometimes I listen to my students' feedback, okay? Students are really, really smart, and they are aware of the differences between native and non-native. And this is can be reflected when they say, I wanted to take a course with a native or with non-native. So this means that they are aware of the differences and they are choosing according to their preferences. All right, I think it's a good time to take a quick Q&A break. We only have a couple questions here, so I'll just go in the order that they were asked. All right, can you see that, Amar? Yeah, I can see them. Can All right. Them. So go ahead and read that and answer that. Okay. So the first question, which is a very challenging question from Ms. or Mrs. Natalie Brundage. She's asking, is in your experience, is English taught in the British accent or American accent taught more in your country? Okay. So, uh, I can answer this question from different sides, but actually uh, the, the variety or most of people here in English in, in, in Egypt uh, prefer learning the American accent because when you ask them why, they say that it is the most dominant accent all over the world. Uh, why? Because all the movies in Hollywood are in American English. All the songs that we hear in the Middle East or all over the world are in American English. Uh, and some students or some uh, non-native speakers are really, uh, are really smart. And I agree with them in the point when they say that it's easier to learn American English than British English for lots of reasons. Because, uh, number one, it looks similar or it is similar to the the sounds of uh, the sounds of Arabic. Number two, the dialects in America itself aren't as um, aren't as many as those dialects in England. You can watch the the professors or the instructors in England who say that they have at least five dialects in England. So it's not easy to learn that. And there is something funny that you native speakers don't know. Uh, we would say that the British, we have, of course, different dialects here in Arabic in Egypt. We have about three or four dialects here in Arabic. According just in to Egypt the, alone? Yes, just in Egypt. According to the north of Egypt, the, the upper Egypt, and so on. Uh, people say that the British accent looks like the accent of the upper Egypt in Egypt. A heavy accent a tough accent when when they pronounce something like ka of course it doesn't make any melody here it looks like a heavy word it's not easy it's it has no melody uh, most of the people here when they come to courses here and they wanted to improve their accent quickly the first vowel or the first sound in american english that they wanted to master is the uh, the, the flapping t Okay, mm. so quickly, teacher, look at me. I say a word like that, water, water. What do you think? I master the American accent. <laughs> it has a wide popularity here in Egypt. Uh, on the other side, we have about 30% or 40% of Egyptians who say that, uh, I don't know why they say that. Uh, we want our children to enter British schools. We want to, uh, I'm, I'm talking about the, the school management or the school supervisors. We need British accent teachers, no American accent. Sorry, when you ask them, why, sir? American accent is accepted, just like the British accent. Ask the tutors in the IELTS speaking exam. No penalty. If you use American accent, British accent, Australian accent, Cockney, Southern. No, 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 no. So I think the most... Good luck with the accent... Cockney accent, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know yeah. how to do that one. <laughs> um, we've got another question here from Ahmed. Yeah. And Ahmed's asking me, Mr. Robert, in your opinion, what is the difference between teaching English in America and Egypt? 
I, I don't know that I can answer that because I haven't taught English in Egypt. Um, but I, I will say from what I'm hearing about the difference, the big thing about teaching English in America is you're teaching to immigrants. So when I've taught at uh, junior colleges, it's been a class of mixed cultures, which is really, really cool. You've got people from all over the world and rather than just focusing on teaching them English and also United States culture, um, we've tried to integrate things that are going on in all of their respective countries, which can be really fun. So it's this really nice blend, uh, this melting pot of cultures. I don't know if that's something that you've also done it in language schools. Did you have international students from all over in language schools that you taught at, Amar? Uh, no, in narrow sense, actually, in certain schools, you might find one percent of of uh, immigrants, okay, uh, non-native speakers who are residents in Egypt, just one or two uh, two percent, okay. So, I mean, this is not a very very uh, big percentage, actually. Okay, so I was I was accurate in what I was saying, but yeah, that's probably one of the biggest differences and something that I really like about teaching in person here. I haven't taught in person for a few years. I, I miss it. Um, hopefully I'll do that again at some point. But yeah, teaching a group of students from all over the world is really a cool experience. But let me help you because uh, I think Ahmed is an uh, Egyptian name and I might understand what's behind this question. And let oh. me clarify it for you, Mr. Robert. I think Ahmed is asking about the difference the difference in techniques, the styles, uh, you, you, you teach language uh, communicatively or not. Uh, Ahmed wants to say that some teachers here in Egypt teach English traditionally. They depend on memorization. Mm. They depend on grammar. I think this is what Ahmed Abdullah means. Yeah. Uh, so thanks for clarifying that. And yeah, he did say, <clears throat> you know, grammar, memorizing words. So yeah, there is a, a big difference, at least in the schools that I've been affiliated with. We're really about a lot of group work, um, like you were saying, communicative teaching methods. Memorization is not something that's taught to adults who are learning English. It's you know something that you probably should be doing on your own when you're building certain vocabulary, but in all honesty, that only works with really basic vocabulary, things that you're going to see every day. If you put, you know, post-it notes around your house, um, I can't really move my camera too much, but your refrigerator, you know, it's no longer that word in Arabic or that word in Spanish. From now on, this is refrigerator. So those types of things that you see every day memorizing those words makes sense but if you're trying to memorize adjectives or you know uh, nouns or verbs that we don't use as often it's not going to be as useful you really need to find those words in stories or hear those words being uttered by somebody who's comfortable with the language so that you have context so for that reason we don't stress memorization and as far as grammar goes memorization in the form of repetition is good if you're the one that's you know producing but yeah it's, it's really about a lot of working with other students reading expressing yourself to uh, explain how you feel about the reading and offering your opinions putting you in different scenarios let's pretend we're at a restaurant how do you order food things like that yeah I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Oh, Ahmed is asking for a quick translation. Did you want to go ahead and translate for him real quick what I was saying? Why not? All right. Uh, yeah, Ahmed, how Mr. Robert, بيقول إن ما فيش فارق كبير بين هنا وبين هناك ولكن هو هناك أو هم عامة هناك بيعتمد أكتر على التطبيق. ضرب لك مثال وقال لك التلاجة احنا مش بنحفظ كلمة تلاجة يكفيك مثلا يعني انجاز التعبير ان انت هتعدي هتشاور على التلاجة فهتشوفها 
بعينيك فتبقى الكلمه بالنسبه لك ملموسه يبقى انت اتعلمت الكلمه هناك هم بيمارسوا اللغه كممارسه عندهم نظام من المدارس اللي هو جنسيات مختلفه فالتعامل مع الجنسيات المختلفه يعني جوه المدرسه يبقى فيه اكتر من جنسيه فبالتالي ده بيخلي الانجليزي عندهم مش مساله اسئله واجابه قد ما هي مساله تواصل كوميونيكيشن بينهم وبين بعض ده الفرق الكبير بيننا وبينهم في حته التدريس yes mr robert awesome sounded beautiful i have no idea what you said <laughs> so you were saying by the way that his name is pronounced ah ahmed is that right ahmed yeah. actually uh, like me like my name in fact my name is ammar the a the a sound does not exist in english number two kh sound another sound which does not exist in english but exists in spanish okay so we have about four or five different uh, different sounds that uh, do not exist in your language but i would like to add something yeah. some people might say which is easier learning arabic or learning english every time i ask my students this question and i give them an example if we have an american english speaker who wants to speak to learn or speak arabic who's going to do it faster you when you learn english or him when he learns uh, learns arabic the fact is arabic is more complex than english the structure in arabic is heavier there is a lot of uh, a lot of uh, difference between arabic and english in grammar and in the sounds themselves you will have some difficulty in producing some sounds in arabic like sad which is a heavier sound than s sound we have dad which is much heavier than d sound we have ta ta which is heavier than t sound so we have ain which doesn't exist in english and you as native speakers non native arabic speakers replace it with ha and the kha you replace it with ahmed so, <laughs> uh, we have a variety of sounds but in fact arabic is more difficult to be acquired i'm sorry to say that <laughs> sorry oh, guys yes. any of you english speakers are looking to learn arabic but I would I would say that what you said still stands. You know, be optimistic, put in the work. You will get there. Maybe it'll take a little bit longer. I hope so. <laughs> All right, we've got uh, one more. Well, we've got a little comment here. Just some kind words for you, Amar. I would agree. You're a very optimistic person, and I would be happy to have you as a teacher if I were learning any language. And then I got another question here, which was actually a question I was going to ask you, which is. What do you love most about teaching English to your students? <laughs> um, when we talk academically about the four skills, I would choose the productive skills. I said productive. I mean teaching is speaking. You know, it's very, very fruitful when you say your students started to make a sentence, started to speak English. I really enjoy uh, teaching students speaking. However, it's some kind, uh, uh, you know, it's challenging. It's not easy to take words out of the mouth of the beginners. You need to be smart enough. You need to work hard on yourself. Prepare a lot as a teacher. Prepare games. Um, also, I enjoy teaching uh, pronunciation. And I would like to say something. You know, when I teach uh, American accent, when I teach pronunciation, however, I am a non-native speaker. I feel like an ambassador, and I represent uh, all the Americans. So I do it honestly. Every time I say, Americans in the North say it like this, Americans in the South. You still remember, of course, the last uh, webinar we had on my page when we talk about when we talked about the different dialects in, in America. So I find it very exciting. When I teach students pronunciation, it's really, really fantastic. Cool. That's, it's funny because pronunciation is one of the things that, at least up until recently, I have loathed 
teaching. I <laughs> because a lot of students will get hung up on pronunciation, meaning they think it's the most important thing and they want to sound like a native speaker. First of all, <laughs> what is a native speaker? We were just talking about there's so many different dialects and there's some countries where even though English isn't the official language, a lot of kids are learning English as a first language. However, there's a new accent, but it's really just a new dialect that's coming up in places like the Philippines, for example. So are they native speakers? I would argue that they are. Um, so I would not worry about getting hung up on sounding perfect, but being able to be understood is a huge deal. And when you're teaching that part of pronunciation, I think it's very important. And I've forced myself to make these pronunciation videos because my students really like them. They tend to get the highest views. And I'm starting to get to the point where I enjoy it. Thank goodness. <laughs> and as your colleague, I would say that you are a fantastic, talented teacher. For As a teacher, as a non-native teacher, I say it now to you and to all the viewers, I learn from you. You have the technology, you have the talent, you have the skill. You are amazing. I enjoy watching your sketches that you prepare by yourself. You teach your pronunciation in a simple way. That, that's really, really helpful. That's Thank really you helpful. so much. I really appreciate that. Thank you very much for your great work. Ah, and Natalie wanted to thank you for speaking your native language. Helps me appreciate the similarities between English and Arabic sounds. Very cool. You're welcome. You're welcome, Mrs. Natalie. Thank you very much. All right. So those were all the questions we had here in the chat. I wanted to give you an opportunity to share some information about your YouTube channel, your Facebook page how students can find you and maybe even take classes with you. So I'm going to put you on solo and uh, feel free to share your screen if you'd like. Well, thank you everybody for watching and paying interest in, uh, in listening to me. As you can see, that's my page. And my page uh, offers one-on-one uh, -on -one classes to non-native speakers, private classes for the a variety of English courses like uh, conversation, uh, general English, uh, preparing for international exams like TOEFL, IELTS, um, uh, CAT, PET, uh, FCE, CAE. And also we offer grammar courses for students who are um, in language schools. We offer this uh, online and in our institution in Damanhur. كل كورساتنا طبعا هي متاحة في دمنهور وفي نفس الوقت كمان online. You can come and in the same time we offer lots of things in our page something like learning english through pictures we uh, we believe in this that a picture is really really important when we learn english okay uh, we offer online games guessing games through our daily and weekly posts you can enjoy competing and guessing the uh, missing letters to learn some new words and uh, also we offer free webinars and uh, uh, free outings with our students. Uh, my page is uh, open all the day, 24 seven. And um, thank you very much for vi visiting my page. And thank you very, very much for uh, your trust. We offer courses, activities, webinars and outings with accredited certificates from the National Educational Network Thank you very, very much. That's my page. My page is called English Vibes. 
<laughs> Sorry about that. Were you <laughs> were you all finished sharing? I, I realized I was muted. I was just saying thanks again so much for coming on and sharing your wisdom and encouraging my students who maybe weren't feeling confident enough. You bring nothing but good vibes, good English vibes, and it's always a pleasure to speak with you, and I'm so glad that my viewers have now had a chance to at least listen to you and ask you some questions here. Um, Thank you very before much. Before we finish up, do you have any final advice for my students? For your students, you are very, very lucky. You have a smart teacher. You have to trust your teacher. I think soon uh, you will improve your English because not only you have uh, a native uh, American speaker, but also you have a smart, talented teacher who offers free services, free webinars, uh, free videos on YouTube. You are very, very lucky. Uh, do your best and work hard and it's a matter of time and you will master English. Thank you so much. You're so kind. All right, you guys. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. I'll see you guys next time.